dedicated to the strength of the nation. Proudly, we hail. Yes, proudly we hail, starring Ruth Hussey in Design for Loving, a United States Army and United States Air Force presentation. And now here is our producer, the well-known Hollywood showman, C.P. McGregor. Thank you, thank you, and greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to your theater of stars, where each week the brightest stars from Hollywood's world of motion pictures join us for your entertainment in plays we know you'll enjoy. Ruth Hussey is our star in the title of our play, Design for Loving. We'll have the curtain for act one of our romantic story, Design for Loving, in just a moment. But first, here's Wendell Niles, who speaks for our government. The uniform of the United States, whether it is worn by a soldier or an airman, means many things to many people. To people abroad, it means that the man wearing that uniform is a protector of the free way of life. To Americans, it means that man inside the Army or Air Force uniform is a defender of freedom and an honored citizen in an honored position. To the man himself, the uniform means service to his country and a valuable career, a career of personal satisfaction and development. Now, once again, our producer. It's curtain time, and here's Act One of Design for Loving, starring Ruth Hussey as Ruth Hardesty. <laughs> Ruth Hardesty looked quite lovely there in that swank Biltmore floral shop in Beverly Hills. Yes, despite a rather harried look, she was lovely. Almost as lovely as the flowers she sold. On a certain Friday evening not so long ago, about ten minutes before her quitting time, one might have detected several things about her. The disappearance of that harried look, a quick sigh, a feminine motion toward a wisp of hair, anticipation. And as to the cause of all these reactions, I could see him approaching the door. He had come last week on Friday, too. He was so tall, he almost had to stoop to get through the door. And so good-looking. I tried to appear busy when he walked up to the counter. <clears throat> oh, good evening. Uh, good evening. I, I wonder if you'd show me some... Yellow roses, weren't they? Well, you, you remembered. Yes, I've always adored yellow roses. Uh, yes, they were so beautiful last week, I, I decided to come back. I'm glad... I mean, we're glad. I have these yellow roses this week. Will they be all right? Well, they'll, they'll be perfect. You want them sent to the same place? Yes, Mrs. Vincent Charles, 23 Palm Drive, Beverly Hills. Mrs. Vincent Charles, 23 Palm Drive, Beverly Hills. Oh, and... Uh, yes? Well, I, I guess that'll be all. Uh, put this card in, please. I will. Oh, thank you. Good night. Uh, good night. Good night. <laughs> I watched him walk out of the door. And then I looked at the tiny envelope in my hand. I suppose I shouldn't have looked inside, but I had to know who he was and who she was. I opened the card. He was Mr. Vincent Charles, engraved. And he'd written on it, To my dearest one. Contretemps, I guess they say. Unlucky happening, unlucky me. I was still standing at the door when Madge walked over. She was my roommate, worked at the store. What are you in a stoop about? Him. Who? The one who was just in here. Oh, you mean Tall, Dark, and Gary Cooper. What a guy. Every Friday night he sends the yellow roses. Ooh, ain't that something. And when I think of that unromantic droop I married... Herman? Oh, don't mention his name to me. That's exactly why he's running that garage over in Azusa by himself. No yellow roses? Yellow roses? Listen, I couldn't get a sprig of parsley out of that character. Oh, oh, let's just forget Herman. Gee, he was so attractive. A nice name, too. Vincent. Oh, well. That's the only way to look at it, dear. I suppose. Whoop! Hold still a minute. What? Wait. Ow! I got it. A gray hair. Don't do that to me. That's the third gray hair somebody has found this week. <laughs> Sammy! Where's that delivery boy? Oh, he could be anywhere. Sammy! Is someone desirous of consulting me? 
Oh, it's you, Grandma. Yes, it's me, and don't be so smart. Okay, Grandma. You heard me. Be sure to take these roses on your next delivery in Beverly Hills. <laughs> okay, Toots. Oh, uh, don't let it get you down. What? That middle-aged spread. <laughs> Will you get out of here? Oh, I'd crown him. Oh, and uh, if I can be of any further help, kindly call my secretary, and I'll try to arrange an appointment. Oh, that little imp. Oh, come on. It's 25 to 6. Let's go home. <laughs> Madge and I had an apartment off Wilshire Boulevard near La Brea. We had a view on one side, but that was being cut off by a huge sign they were erecting. We had dinner and washed the dishes, and then I collapsed in a chair, and Madge brought up the mail. Well, they sure are putting that sign up fast. They sure are. And ruining our view. Oh, what a shame. We won't even be able to see the La Brea tar pits. Mail? Mm, not much. Only this brochure on Snow Valley. Mm, nice place. Nice place for long underwear. Anything else? Mm, college alumni news. Yours. Thanks. Class of 1941. Used to be on the first page. Now we're on page four. We're moving back into the dark ages. Dark ages? Oh, now, Ruth, don't let it get you down. Oh, seriously, though, Marge. Do you think I'm getting old? Are you kidding? Well, really, does it, does it look like I'm getting a... Middle-aged spread. Oh, honey, are you going to listen to what some little punk says? No, no, tell me, Madge. Tell me the truth. Oh, I'm telling well, you. Well, please, after all, you're my best friend. Well, honey, we all have to get a little older, the way time is measured. <laughs> oh, Madge. Oh, honey, you asked me. I knew you'd been keeping something from me. Oh, now, Ruth, please don't lose yourself. Wait, you, you don't know how it is. 27 going on 28 and having trouble convincing people you're 23 going on 24. Oh, honey, I was there so long ago it scares me. Come on. <laughs> Step out of it. Oh, oh, dear. I'm sorry. That's better. Blow it in Mother's handkerchief. Now, listen, Ruth, what's wrong with you? You've been mooning around ever since that guy walked in the shop a week ago. Well, it's very simple. I want a man. I want to get married. That does it. What? Every girl I ever knew cries her eyes out, breaks her heart over a simple little easy thing like getting a man. Well, that's easy enough for you to say. You've got yours. Listen, I didn't marry a man. I married a carburetor. That's why I'm here, and he's in that garage in Azusa. Well, if I were you, I'd go right back to him. And drain crankcases the rest of my life? Not while I'm a sane person. But Madge. Oh, well, Herman was <laughs> sort of cute. Whenever I was around him too much, I wanted to hit him with a tire iron. And you don't know what you've got, that's all. Oh, I don't, huh? I married an unsentimental grease monkey. Oh, seriously, honey? Don't let a little thing like the absence of a man in your life get you down. A man's easier to land than a barracuda any time. You think so? Sure. I've got a foolproof formula. You do? Positively. First of all, you've got to clear your mind. Sweep out the cobwebs. Get your mind off getting a man. But how can I do that? Oh. Easiest thing in the world. Buy clothes and go somewhere. But where? Mm. Why not Snow Valley? Say, say, I've never worn a ski outfit. Oh, you'd look darling. And you have your bonus. Well, they wouldn't miss me at the store for a few days. Of course not. That settles that you're going to Snow Valley. All right. And listen, honey, I've heard there are more men up there than pine trees. Really? Happy hunting grounds. <laughs> now, the second part of my formula, and this is very important. You start now. You've got to think of your perfect man, then he'll appear. Hmm. But how will I know? Oh, you'll know. You'll have a feeling down your spine like someone pressed a cold teaspoon against it. Did you use this formula to get Herman? I was perfecting it at the time. <laughs> you see how far I had to go. Come on. Let's get you on your way up to Snow Valley. I got my ski clothes, a round-trip bus ticket, which included my hotel room. Oh, it was wonderful leaving the town and the apartment with the signboard that was spoiling our view of the tar pits. All the way up to Snow Valley, I did what Madge said. I thought of my perfect man. And believe it or not, Madge's formula was working. Well, that afternoon in the hotel lobby, a little man with a mustache walked up. Oh, excuse me. Aren't you Ruth Hardesty? Yes. A new arrival, too. I just arrived this morning. A joy to have you. I'm Spencer Gaines, the social director for the hotel. How nice. Now, there's a gentleman here who is, uh, well, to put it mildly, anxious to meet you. Well. His name is J. Frederick Klugelhorn. Klugelhorn? Yes, he's a gentleman right down there in the beige earmuffs. Oh. A very old Texas family. 
extremely wealthy. <laughs> well, Miss Hardesty. Why, uh, uh, why not? And as we walked over toward him, I had that feeling Madge described, a cold teaspoon on my spine. No, no, it was a tablespoon. I rolled the name over in my mind. Ruth Klugelhorn. Something musical about the sound. As we approached him, I could see Frederick had a high forehead. As a matter of fact, he had a widow's peak in reverse back at the crown of his head. <laughs> kind of cute, though. And then we were being introduced. Uh, Mr. Klugelhorn, this is Miss Hardesty. Howdy, Miss Hardesty. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Klugelhorn? Well, I'll, uh, I'll leave you two alone now. <laughs> Well, Miss Hardesty, I can't tell you how glad I am to meet you. Oh, how nice of you to say so. You came up here a week ago, didn't know a soul. That's a shame. Been sitting around here all week, twiddling my earmuffs. Loneliest man from Dallas you ever saw. Till I seen you. Then I brightened up like a steer in clover. Well, you wouldn't give me the credit for all that. I most certainly would. Hey, Miss Hardesty, I'd be most grateful if you'd have dinner with me tonight. Well, I... Oh, I, I think that would be lovely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mr. Klugelhorn, you mad, mad person. <laughs> uh, just call me Fred. <laughs> All right, Fred. And you know, I think it's just fascinating the way you say you have more oil wells on your property in Texas than trees. I'm loaded with them, honey, loaded. But tell me, why did you want to meet me? Well, I'll tell you. I saw you coming in. You look lonesome, girl. I did. And you look scared, like you needed something. Protection, care. Like you needed a man's arm around you. Oh, Mr. Klugelhorn. Fred. Fred. Besides that, you're the spitting image of my daughter, Amy. She's about your age, too. 31 going on 32. Imagine that. He was a father, and he thought I was 31 going on 32. I was never so embarrassed. I excused myself and ran upstairs and threw my things into my bag. Then I took the next bus back to Los Angeles. Madge was at the apartment when I returned. Honey, you're back. Already you're back. You, I could swat you with this ski pole. What's wrong? Oh, you and your formula. Didn't it work? Your formula got me a Methuselah with a southern accent. What, say, what's that keeps blinking on and off? A sign. They finished it. Lovely, lovely neon. This I want to see. Oh, no. Old maid starch, stiff as an old maid smile. Oh, no, Madge, no. We pause briefly from our story, Designed for Loving, starring Ruth Hussey, to bring you an important message from our government. This is the air age we're living in, and the young men with wings are the young men with a sure, secure future. You can be a young man with wings if you're one of the best, because only the best can become aviation cadets. The United States Air Force will sign you up for aviation cadet pilot training if you pass the physical examination and fulfill two simple qualifications. You must be between 20 and 26 and one half years of age, and you must have at least two years of college or be able to pass an equivalent examination. The finest aviation training in the world will be yours. After a year of training and successful completion of the course, you'll be commissioned an officer in the Air Force Reserve. Those silver wings will be yours. Outstanding graduates receive regular commissions in the United States Air Force immediately. Ask for your application at your nearest Air Force base our United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station. And remember, only the best are aviation cadets. Our curtain rises on Act Two of Design for Loving, starring Ruth Hussey as Ruth Hardesty. Well, right about here, a little music is quite appropriate, maestro. A few strains of mood music for our lovely young lady of the Biltmore Florist in Beverly Hills, Ruth Hardesty, whose excursion to Snow Valley ended in romantic disaster. Not to mention the sign that greeted me from my apartment window, Old Maid Starch. 
I went back to work at the shop in Beverly Hills. Mr. Graham Dival, the owner, was wonderful. Just asked me if I brought back any icicles. I was a pretty sad character. And not helping matters out in the least, he had to come in. Vincent. Well, good afternoon. Oh, good afternoon. You uh, seem surprised. I am. Why? Well, this is Tuesday. You, you usually come in on Friday. Uh, her birthday. Oh. Oh, you'll want yellow roses? Uh, two dozen this time, I think. Very well. Uh, send them to Mrs. Vincent Charles. Oh, I can remember the name. Well. And the... Uh, yes, and the address. Oh, very good. And uh, one other thing. Yes? Uh... Uh, well? You, you, you sure that you have the address? Yeah, 23 Palm Drive, Beverly Hills. Mm -hmm. mm, that's right. I thought it was. Uh, and you'll charge it? Yes, I will. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I guess I'll be moving along. Mm -hmm. Good night. Oh, oh, no, no, not that door. That mm -hmm. leads to the refrigerator. Oh, oh dear. Oh, how, oh. how stupid of me. I, I might have stepped oh. right on a box of gardenias. <laughs> well, uh, I'll be going. Hey, hey, I, I can't see. <laughs> well, of course. Not. You put that flower pot on your head instead of your hat. Oh, well, uh, well, good night. <laughs> good night. Good night. It, there was, there was something strange about Mr. Vincent Charles. Somehow I thought I saw a glimmer of something in his eyes. Oh, but how ridiculous of me. How can I deny there was a Mrs. Vincent Charles? I wonder what she's like. I want to know. I, I dashed back to Sammy, the delivery boy. He was loading the truck. Sammy! Sammy! Oh, hiya, Toots. Where's the fire? Well, I, I wanted to be sure to get uh, some roses on this delivery. Mrs. Vincent Charles in Beverly Hills. That dame again? Uh, you've seen her? No, but I remember the name. I go to that place every week. Sammy. Huh? When you deliver the flowers this time, wait and see what she's like, will you? Why? Well, I, I want to know. <laughs> okay, Toots. For you, I'll do it. Well, Ruth, your private eye is here to report. Did you see her? I saw and converse with the lady. Well? Say, what do I get for all this sleuthing? Oh, now, don't be difficult, Sammy. I'm a lot of my own good heart. Anyway, I'll tell you. Y yes, Sammy. Yeah. Say, say, why are you so interested? Oh, Sammy, will you please tell me? All right, all right, all right. I'll tell you. I have never seen a more gorgeous dame. Oh, did you say gorgeous? Oh, what hair. Flaxen gold. What eyes. Turquoise blue. What a smile. Oh, it would melt cement. Honest, I've seen dames. Oh, not like this one. It's what he would choose. He? Who? Oh, ne never mind, Sammy. Thanks. Thank you, Sammy. Thanks. <laughs> The trip home on the La Brea bus that night was a dismal one. Even the tar pits were shrouded in fog. And when I got to the apartment, I had another surprise waiting for me. It had been Madge's day off, and when I got there, she was packing. Oh, honey. Honey, I, I'm so glad to see you. Oh, Madge, what in the world are you doing? I'm packing, honey. Well, I can see that, but why? I'm going back to Herm, Ruth. Back to Herm and Azusa. Oh, Madge. Oh, I'm so glad. He did the sweetest thing. The sweetest thing you can imagine. Say, what, what in the world is this? That's it. He sent it to me. Oh, looks something like an ashtray. That's what it is, honey. Herm went out, had it gold-plated and everything. Oh, that was nice of him. The sweetest thing. Oh, what, what, what is it? The hubcap off the 1928 hubmobile he proposed to me in. No. Wasn't that sweet? And he put a note in it. He did? He always had a gift for words. Here. Here, look. Lest we forget. Well. <laughs> Wasn't that sweet? Oh, I'm going to him, Ruth. And I'm never going to throw another tire in our at him again. Not as long as I live. Oh, good for you, Madge. Well, I, I think I've got everything. All except my ashtray. Oh, and Ruthie, I'll still share your rent till you get another girl. Oh, thanks, Madge. Is Herman going to pick you up here? Oh, no. No, I'll grab a cab. I'm going to meet him at a piston ring place on Main Street. Oh. Well, honey, you come and see us in the Sousa, won't you? Yeah, I will, Madge. Mm -hmm. Oh, you've been a swell roomie. Oh, now, Madge, please don't. No, don't. You won't be lonely now, will you? No, Madge, I won't be lonely. I won't be honest. Goodbye.
Goodbye. Oh, Madge. Madge. Um, who is it? It's me, Miss Hardesty. Who? It's Vincent Charles, Miss Hardesty. Oh, dear. Um, oh, uh, uh, come in, Mr. Charles. Oh, thank you. What? Well, you've been crying. I, um, I, I, I just saw a friend off uh, for Europe or somewhere in that vicinity. You know how it is, seeing old friends off. Oh, yes, of course. But well, what are you doing here, Mr. Charles? Well, Miss Hardesty, for over a month now, I've been trying to get up courage to ask you to go to dinner with me. Well... I just now accomplished that feat, and I didn't want to wait until the store opened tomorrow. Oh, but Mr. Charles, y your wife and the roses. Oh, no, no, I sent those to my mother, Mrs. Vincent Charles. Our delivery boy just happened to mention a very lovely young woman. Who... Oh, that, that's my sister. She's about your age, 22, going on 23. Oh, really? Uh -huh. Yes, and oh. do you know she's already worried she's going to be an old maid? Oh, isn't that silly? Uh, but, Miss Hardesty, <laughs> before I lose courage again, will you dine with me some evening? Why, I'd love to, Mr. Charles. Chris, I, I couldn't possibly presume you'd be free tonight. Mr. Charles, fate must have directed you. This is the first evening in months for which I've made no plans. Oh, then, then would you join me, please? Why not? <laughs> Are you enjoying yourself? Beautifully. You know, you look even lovelier tonight than the first time I saw you. I've been meaning to ask you... What brought you into the store? Well, you see, I'm an outdoor advertising man. I make signs. Oh. I made the one outside your apartment. Old maid starch. Yes, I oh. mustn't let my sister see it. Oh, no, <laughs> no. It's a lovely sign, though. Do you mm. think so? Oh, marvelous, marvelous addition to the tar pit. Oh, thank you. You see, I was working on that project, and I happened to see you leave the apartment. Believe it or not, I followed you to work. I must confess, I haven't been able to get you out of my mind ever since then. Oh, Vincent. Would you like to dance? Oh, let's do. You know something? What? I have a friend who says when you really fall in love, you'll know it. Because you feel like someone pressed a cold teaspoon against your spine. Yes. <laughs> Only it's more like a cold gravy ladle. <laughs> oh, hold me close, Vincent. Close. The curtain falls in the final act of Design for Loving. Our star, Ruth Husby, will return for a curtain call after this timely message from Wendell Niles. Late last year, the Congress of the United States authorized changes in the medical department of the United States Army. It's not the medical department of World War II. Not anymore. Today, in addition to doctors, dentists, nurses, and veterinarians, there are 18 other fields for trained specialists in commission grade, with all the opportunities available for careers, career guidance, and a safe, secure future in the United States Army. If you qualify, you can be commissioned in grades from second lieutenants to colonel. Some of the medical specialists needed at this time are qualified clinical psychologists, biochemists, and especially pharmacists. But the opportunities do not stop with these few categories. Eighteen fields are wide open to qualified professionals in medicine and the allied sciences. Be sure to write for further information to the Chief Procurement Branch, Personnel Division, Office of the Surgeon General, Department of the Army, the Pentagon, Washington, D.C. And now back at the microphone, our star, Ruth Hussey, and our producer. Ruth, this is a very auspicious event on Proudly We Hail. It's your third visit with us. C.P., I'm always happy to appear on your fine program. I think you'd be interested to know that I had lunch today with Mr. Jordan. Oh, I remember him. He was connected with the very first U.S. Army show. That's right, Warriors of Peace. He wanted to see you again because you were so charming... And you were the very first star to appear for free on any Army show. Well, that was nice of him. And speaking of shows, did my husband tell you what happened at our house during the last play I did with you? No, but your husband, Bob Longnecker, and I were on the phone this morning. 
He said you'd have to tell the story. Well, I was in the East when the show was broadcast out here, and Bob had a dinner engagement with McDonald Carey, and late as usual, was rushing to get dressed. Yes. And little Robbie said, Daddy, tell me a story. The usual request. Well, just then the telephone rang, and someone said, Bob, Ruth's on proudly. We hail. You better tune in right away. So Bob said to Robbie, Mommy's on the air. You listen, and she'll tell you a story. Then Bob went on with his dressing. Until he heard Robbie crying. Daddy, Mommy's going to let the people take me to an orphan's home. You remember the story? Yes, the family had adopted a baby boy, and because it looked as though they couldn't support him, the court was going to return the child to the orphan's home. That's it. Well, Bob finally convinced him it was just a story, and nothing like that was going to happen to him. And then he went back to his room to finish dressing. And? Robbie began crying his eyes out again. Again? <laughs> yes. <laughs> this time it was because I said, Goodbye, C.P., and didn't say goodbye to either Robbie or Johnny. <laughs> well, we'll have to set that right right now. But first, I want to tell you about our story for next week. Oh, yes. Who's going to be with you? Next week, Ruth, and ladies and gentlemen, our star will be the sensational young actress Arlene Dahl and the title of our bright Western comedy, Deep in the Heart. This is the story of a girl who left Texas to bring her great talent for acting to Hollywood. That's fine. We'll all be listening. And now, goodbye, Johnny. And goodbye, Robbie. And goodbye, C.P. <laughs> <laughs> goodbye, Ruth and Johnny and Robbie. Be sure to join us next week, ladies and gentlemen, when we bring you Arlene Dahl in Deep in the Heart. Until then, thanks for listening, and cheerio from Hollywood. <laughs> Ruth Hussey appeared through the courtesy of the Hollywood Coordinating Committee, which arranges for the appearance of all stars on this program. The script was by Rich Hall, with music under the direction of Eddie Scrivani. This program is transcribed in Hollywood for release at this time. Wendell Niles speaking.